Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence for the Against the Spread podcast here on the YouTube channel and playbooksports.com. Joining us for the show, as always, our good friends Andy Esco from TheLogicalApproach.com, the legendary Jim Feist from Las Vegas, and our producer Greg De Palma from Crime Sports Network. This is a special edition show, guys, and what we're going to do is we're going to review some of the best and the worst from the 2023 football season, both college and pro football. And I'm sure there's a lot to be said about the football season. While it's still fresh in our minds, we're going to attack the subject on the show here today. And with that, Andy, I'm going to welcome you into the show. How's everything going for you this post-football season? Everything's been going nicely, of course, still uh, following up and getting uh, some of the things in order for next football season. But right now, enjoying uh, the lead up into the NCAA tournament. And, of course, the conference tournaments will start in a few ga- days, I believe, uh, I think the Atlantic Sun kicks it off on Tuesday, and then you got the Arch Madness with the Missouri Valley later in the week, and of course the big guys about uh, two weeks from today will be uh, starting up. So that'll be uh, a a lot of fun, and uh, everything's going well, and we've actually been enjoying some nice weather here in Vegas over the last few days. Speaking of Vegas, Jim Feist joins us from Las Vegas as well. Jim, on the mend right now, I'm glad he was able to join us for the show today. Jim, how are you doing these days? I'm feeling a lot better than... Uh, that was 10, 10 days ago, but uh, I'm still on the mend and um, hopefully be back 100% by next week. That's awesome. We look forward to that. Jim will also be joining us on our basketball shows, most likely starting next week or the week after. Just depends upon how the men goes. Greg <laughs> Diploma, <laughs> how, how is things going for you these days, Greg? Doing good. Just starting up with... Uh, NASCAR and golf, those seasons are picking up. Masters is a month away. So uh, when you get to the Florida swing, it starts getting exciting for the professional golf. And, um, yeah, so uh, horse racing also. We're, we're into the big stretch here for Kentucky Derby prep races. Florida Derby's coming up in your neck of the woods in the next few yep. weeks. They had a big race coming up uh, actually on Saturday the fountain of youth down by you at the Gulfstream park. So yeah, it's not always the big sports, the one that the ones that everybody always pays attention to. And I'm very excited about my hockey team uh, who's in first place in the West Vancouver. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of different sports going on outside of football and basketball and even baseball. uh, And, uh, and I like them all. I was hoping you were going to adopt my hockey team, the Florida Panthers, but uh (laughs) <laughs> I, st- I still can't quite put them at the top of the echelon. The, the guys in Vegas have that right with the Vegas Knights beating Florida in the championship in the finals last year, but they're having a nice season themselves as well are the Florida Panthers. Uh, we'll get to that probably when we get into the postseason when National Hockey League comes. But right now, let's talk a little bit about what happened this 2023 football season. I want to remind everybody out there that this is being produced to you by our friends at uwager.lv, where they feature every Friday night, you get minus 105 juice on everything you play for the weekend. You can check it out with free same day payouts. That's all available at uwager.lv. Log on or give them a call at 1-800-U-WAGER. And with that, let's start it off here now about the football season in review. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the best and the worst aspects of what we saw on the show. And just a quick reminder also that if you like what we're doing here on the show, click the like button below, or if you have any comments or questions, we've got answers. Simply click on the comment button below as well. We'd love to hear from you. Speaking about the best and worst in college football, Andy, I'm going to hand it off to you. Let you run with the ball first. You've got the first play on our football show this weekend. What are you running a draw, a pass or going for the touchdown? Uh, probably I'll, I'll run with a, a quarterback Neil, uh, <laughs> but uh, not really. That would be sort of like the uh, least exciting thing that happened this year. But, uh, no, I like the fact that we had some new blood, uh, competing for, uh, the, uh, the championship game, Washington in there for the uh, first time you had, uh, unfortunately, Florida state was in contention for a long part of the uh, season. I like the fact that, uh, uh, Michigan and Ohio state were unbeaten heading into their matchup at the end of the year. And of course, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Michigan got the national title, which was kind of nice for the long-suffering fans of Michigan who got to see uh, Jim Harbaugh, who himself endured a lot of uh, controversy throughout the season, uh, was able to go out uh, with a uh, uh, with a national championship and uh, head over to the NFL and see if he can work his magic where he's uh, done before with uh, San Francisco, for example. Uh, it seems that there was a lot more parity, but also a lot of teams that uh, uh, I, I guess it's probably – probably related to the 
uh, to the least things that I liked about it because it had to do with a lot of so many of these teams were able to rely on effective transfers from the transfer portal and end up showing that they really didn't need a year or two of experience with that team that they came in very well tested with other teams and so we saw I think a, a lot of high quality football for a good part of the season uh, but uh, again well when we get to the negative things um, unfortunately I remember more of the negative things about the season than the situation of college football than I do the uh, the positives although overall it was a very good season and provided a lot of entertaining games and uh, you know, it, it always looks it always looks really good as you're playing at the time. And now that we're doing the retrospective, you find a little things that you didn't see before that perhaps you wish you hadn't seen. I mean, I can relate to you, Andy. You always remember those bad beats, the wins that you win. You sort of figured you had the game handicapped. You were supposed to win the game. And even if it was uh, fortuitous or not, you still won the game. But it's the bad beats that tend to stick out. Jim Feist, what do you recall most, what was most satisfactory, satisfying to you this football season for the 2023 year? Uh -huh. Well, I, I personally spend a lot more time on the pros than the colleges. I'm better at it, and I have more success with it. The, the NFL, if, if I looked at the whole season as a whole, the quality of football was not to the standard that we have seen in the past. Um, but at the end of the season, it got pretty interesting. With the, the, the better teams, of course, rise to the top. I never expected Kansas City to be in the Super Bowl. When they started the season off, they had the problems with the wide receivers. They had a lot of changes. Things just didn't seem to click. But somehow they turned it around near the end of the season. And when they went through the playoffs, I mean, they murdered Miami at home. But Miami was kind of out of their element playing in such cold weather and with injuries. And then, of course, they went up to Buffalo and they handled them. The score was closer than than the game was and then they went down to Baltimore and Baltimore was a huge favorite a lot of money came in on Baltimore I and mean, both squares and pros came in on Baltimore in that game and they just weren't in the game so a lot of credit to Andy Reid and, and company uh, you know, I guess we have to give a special shout out to, to Swifty for helping uh, and, uh, yes. <laughs> but they did it. And I mean, it went in overtime. It's a, it was an even game. It was a good game. We all, I think we all sided with that side, and we were happy for the result. To me, it was it was great. I love to see the fact that Harbaugh is back in, in the pros. I, I don't know if he'll turn it around in year one, but I don't. And, and the reason I say that is I don't think he's going to have a lot of pressure on him to do it in year one. Uh, because, I mean, they have some roster issues money-wise, salary cap issues but he has a quarterback and he if they let him be the football guy making the decisions he will win he will compete for that division and he will go go far because that's who he is he's a tremendous coach and he's done it at all levels so that's going to be interesting what will happen with Dak Prescott and and Jerry Jones and that fiasco down there I don't know I don't know what happened in that game they played against Green Bay, they were never in it. And C.D. Lamb and Dak seemed to be in different ballparks that day. They weren't even on the same team for a while. And so there's a lot of things going on. I mean, who would you favor in the NFC East right now? Is it Philadelphia to come back off the awful ending? Is it Dallas to overcome the fact that they have a $55 million salary hit just with Dak alone? Um, you know, in Washington and – you know, is, is who's going to be quarterback? That new owner, new coach. So what's going? To, what are they going to do with that? They have some talent. Uh, there's there's a lot of questions across the league now. And you look at the North with the Lions, with the Packers. What are the Bears going to do with their quarterback situation and the number one pick? And will the number one pick pay off? Because I know everybody talks about the number one pick, number one pick, number one pick. But how many times do they actually work out? Not that often. It's more of a miss than a hit. So there's so many great questions. And, of course, we got the, the fiasco up in Denver with Russell Wilson and Sean Payton. And Russ uh, had his better days in, in Seattle. And the, that might have been the, uh, the biggest steal ever when Denver paid so much for him. And he sure, sure has not shown up. 
That or the trade that uh, Carolina made to Chicago uh, just for the right to move up to Bryce Young and give up all that collateral, all that capital. And uh, here's Chicago yeah. reaping the rewards of that this particular football season. But uh, I'm going to circle back to that when I, we move on a little bit deeper into the NFL side of things. Greg De Palma, what did you, your take on that 2023 college football season? What did you like and what did you not like? Well, it's obvious from just taking a look at my room here. I know you see the M, uh, a little bit of the M and my R, because uh, Greg Schiano is definitely bringing Rutgers back to when he was coaching, and I feel real confident that in the next couple of years, uh, they're going to be a top twenty program again. So, um, but as far as Michigan, yeah, uh, I mean, what else can I say? It's been whatever. I forget how long it was, 25 years or so since they won a, a national championship, a title. So I was very, very pleased with that uh, and uh, pleased with the process because we actually lived the process, Mark, you and I, because three or four years ago when he was on the hot seat, um, you know, we talked about that first season after um, that the signs were there because the trends that you guys uh, and, and, and we talked about it so often about, well, Harbaugh's. Oh, for this or one for that. And all those trends started to go away very slowly as the years started to go on. And he changed back to his old philosophy of just uh, building a strong offensive line, playing power football and relying on your defense. So I thought that was very enjoyable. I think it was also very enjoyable for at least one week to see Deion Sanders uh, have a, a dramatic win as a 20 point dog uh, opening weekend against a playoff team from the previous season. So I thought that was fun. Everybody enjoyed that. I thought it got a little bit ridiculous as the season wore on. I think there was a little bit too much attention paid to him at times, but he's definitely good for the game. Um, moving ahead, I'm excited about the playoffs and how can we not be? Uh, I, you know, I still don't think people realize how big this is going to be. I just don't. I think people just don't get how excited this country is going to be when you have all of those teams competing for a playoff berth and at the perfect time too because parity uh as uh, andy alluded to before it's it's hit us it's hit us because of the nil it's hit us because of the portal uh i think the days of seeing the georges and the clemsons and the alabamas go on four or five year you know, dominant runs are over. I just think they are. You can't. There's all these guys who are going elsewhere and getting paid to go elsewhere. You can't just have these sec, you know, second and third team uh, deep uh, rosters because those guys aren't going to sit on the bench when they can get paid to start somewhere else. So um, I think more than anything, I'm very excited about next year's playoff system. You know, there's people already talking about expanding to 16 teams. We haven't got to 12 <laughs> yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, I'm with you, Greg. I, I'm looking forward to the playoffs as well. I think it'll just uh, it'll add a whole new element to the game uh, from a week to week perspective and keep you more in tune to uh, what's going on in the college football world. If you ask me what I like the most about the college football season is I like the fact that they got it right with the Heisman Trophy winner, Jaden Daniels. Uh, there was so much talk early on in the season about Caleb Williams and, he, you know, as Southern Cal began to crumble so too did his chances and then who was the uh, next successor in line behind him and Greg I got to give you coders because you were on Jaden Daniels like almost from the get-go and uh, you wrote him right to the finals and uh, he cashed and I'm I'm going to be really excited to see what he does in the National Football League draft what team's going to select him right now there's a lot of rumors that he might end up in New England but uh, he's truly an electric football player and I think he'll be much, much better than what Bryce Young was with the Carolina Panthers this year. I look, go back and I look at maybe the most disappointing or worst things I saw in the football season for 2023. One is most likely the demise of the Pac-12 conference. It's just heartbreaking to see what happened to that conference, uh, a tradition-rich conference like it is, and they, they have to fall prey to the ugliness of the world of college football as it is today. Uh, and unfortunately, there was nothing there to save the conference. We're now down to what will be a Pac-2, if you can believe it. Somehow they're going to play a Pac-2. Andy, are they going to play a Pac-2? And will the Pac-2 be part of a Power 5 conference? Do you, have you heard word of that? Andy just stepped away for his oh, okay. uh, package delivery. But uh, you know what also is going to be quite interesting in a positive or negative fashion in the same light, Mark, is going to be the fact that we're going to see Big 12 teams in the SEC – Pac-12 teams in the Big Ten, and in a way, it'll be exciting just to see matchups that you don't ever see, 
But I just wonder how long that that's going to kind of wear off and be kind of just strange. And are we, are, because I think we are inevitably, may take five years or 10 years, but I think we're inevitably at the point where it's going to be a wide open affair, sort of like the NFL, where you're just going to have maybe two conferences and, you know, certain amount of teams making the playoffs and all that other stuff. I, I think they're getting closer and closer to being almost uh, run like a professional league uh, and not just financially speaking with the money that these kids are now making. You know, the collateral damage that comes with something like that, Greg, is uh, uh, what happens to the college football rivalries as we knew them, as these teams go well, to new, new conferences. It's well, a shame to see these rivalries dissipate the way they will uh, moving forward uh, coming on here. And they have to just geographically because of where they're moving to. You're taking teams from the Pac-12 conference on the West Coast and moving them to the East Coast to play football games. And, uh, you know, we're going to lose a lot of that, uh, I, I think, that rivalry stuff, which as a young handicapper growing up, that's what I feasted on. What I look forward to the most was rivalry football games. Uh, we're not going to have as much of that, but – Hey, we're going to have to adjust and we're going to have to get along and it'll end up being what it'll end up being. Well, how, how funny is it going to be? I mean, I'm already looking forward to the fact that I think Rutgers will be playing at USC this year. I mean, seeing <laughs> Rutgers out there at the L.A. Coliseum and then uh, UCLA coming to Piscataway to take on Rutgers. I mean, these are things that you just uh, you just don't think about. And Texas is going to be like playing. I don't know what their schedule is, but. You know, be, it'll be a commonplace. They'll be playing like LSU and Auburn and Oklahoma. Will be play. I mean, it's just going to be very strange. But again, like I said in the beginning, I think it should be fun to see things that we don't normally see. Yeah, it should we, be. We know, we know that everything changes over time. And in 40, 50, 60 years from now, people won't even remember the things that we're talking about today. But they'll have their own new, their own normal, let's call it. And, and for so many years, these college kids would get a college degree that unfortunately some of them, many of them weren't able to use very well. But now there's the money issue. Everything's always going to go back to the money issue. So these kids, some of these kids, and, and I don't know the breakdown of how it works out, but I, I read the other day where Caleb Williams might have already made $10 million being you know, in college. And, and now they're talking about this girl coming out to go to the WNBA draft. She might make more staying at Iowa than going into the draft for the WNBA. So it's the whole thing is different and it changes and changes and inevitable. But we're going to create new rivalries. How, and here's the question though for us, and especially for you guys that spent a lot of time, be, you know, I, I'm, I follow mostly in college. I don't, I don't initiate except in college basketball I do, but not in college football. Where you guys, especially Mark, you, you initiate a lot of your own opinions, and you have a database that goes way back. But that, debate, that database is not going to include a lot of things that are there now because, like you said, the breakdown of who they play and when they play and everything else is going to be so different. How is it going to affect your life from a handicapping perspective well i'll be honest with you jim uh, the database is what the database is uh you ask the questions it gives the answers it doesn't give you the results but it gives you the answers to the questions you ask and so the questions we're going to be asking moving forward are going to be more relative to what is going on in the sport today as perhaps it was in the past i think the biggest change will be uh the alignment and the makeup of conferences in the past if i ask questions about the uh, pac-12 championship games or Pac-12 playoffs or uh, Pac-12 performances in bowl games, which have been horrific. Uh, that's all going to go out the window because it's all going to pertain more to the here and the now, which a lot of people seem to think handicapping, you're better off looking at the here and the now as opposed to in the past. But it's a blend of everything that uh, ends up really ultimately working. So I'm a little bit concerned about it. Yes, I am. Uh, but we're going to adapt. You know, uh, we're going to have to adapt. We don't have a choice. And right. uh you know, so it'll end up being what it'll end up being. My biggest concern is with the advent of the portal transfer and the NIL, what on God's green earth is going to happen to the game of college football as we know it? Andy, what do you think? Yeah, Andy uh, is still. Oh, he's still, uh, he's still out? Okay, yes. I'm sorry. So um, I'll let oh, you know. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, uh, but, and, and I was looking at the <laughs> schedule, by the way, because I knew you, you wanted to talk about this. So Washington State, their schedule this year is going to be 
primarily Mountain West teams. So uh, what, I don't know what that says, uh, but that that's that's how they're going to run their schedule, playing like Boise State and San Jose State and uh, Utah State. I think about uh, 70% of their games are Mountain West games. It's almost, so it's almost like they're a Mountain West team this year. Yes, right. And they'll end the season, I believe, with Oregon State as one of their last games. So now they are – they do qualify – if they run the table, they can qualify for the playoffs. So it's not like, you know, they've been banished or anything like that. It's just that for now, until they find a league, a conference, uh, they're going to have to come up with uh, some of these weird schedules. And uh, this year it looks like it's going to be the Mountain West. Well, it sounds like it would probably be best if they ended up affiliating with the Mountain West. They Why not? A little, a little yeah. strength of the conference. Exactly right. And, you know, they have a home, a place to call home at least. Uh, as how, how, will it, how will it affect their recruiting when That's a great question. You're, you're basically saying now you're playing in the Mountain West. You're no longer a Pac-12 team because really they're I mean, there is no Pac-12. So right. And then a lot of their friends are going to be playing in the Big Ten, which will be now some other name. But so I mean, how, these kids look at that and they say, "Okay, I'm For playing sure. in the Mountain West, and they're playing at Ohio State." And you know, it, it's got to have an effect that we're not even maybe not thinking about very much. Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. I, need, I never honestly even gave any thought to that about the impact from a recruiting standpoint. Uh, you know, some of these teams that are hooking up with the big power five conferences are going to benefit from that, just the fact that their name is attached to the conference. But the guys right. that aren't, uh, I think that's going to end up being a, a little bit of a, a problem for them. And uh, Well, they have, to... a, uh, but they do get an advantage if you want to, call it that but the one advantage is yeah they're going to be able to buy uh some of these kids and before they didn't have that opportunity so at least now hey you know what still you can say what you want but money money talks so it's all going to depend how much money does washington state and oregon state have to spend what are their nil uh bank accounts looking like and that's what we're going to find out for sure more than anything all right, what a sad state of affair that is, Greg. Uh, it depends upon how good a college football team will recruit, depending upon how much money they have to That's pay it. these players. That's know. why they're talking about in time. I think most people do believe that, again, I don't know how long it's going to take. Give it time. They're going to unionize. It's going to be like the NFL. Now, I know the college kids probably don't really want that in a way. Some of them don't. But there's be a lot of kids that don't make good money that will, and they are the majority of the players that make up the the sport. So I think that's why that'll happen, and then you'll get collective bargaining, just like the NFL. So believe it or not, that that will happen. It's just a matter of how long it'll take. Hey, you're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. We've got a special edition show. This is our best and worst from the 2023 football season. And with that, let's move it over exclusively to the NFL side of things. And uh, any word from Andy that you know of right now? At He's this point, uh, right? still uh, trying to, he's actually trying to get his computer running right now. Okay. So uh, okay. he'll, uh, yeah, he should hopefully, he says it's, uh, it's taking a little bit of time, but hopefully he'll okay. be with us shortly. Very good. So uh, with that, Jim, I'm going to move it to you and let you elaborate a little bit more. You, uh, you did a real nice overview on the National Football League to begin with. But uh, let me target this a little bit more specifically to you and uh, tell me exactly what it was you felt the best thing that happened in the NFL was this year. Well, I, I mean, I, the best thing for me was I won like 11 out of 12 bets <laughs> in the Super Bowl. <laughs> yes. so, so I just lost my earpiece. But th that, that, was, that was pretty damn good. But I'm, I'm really happy for the chance for a team to three peeps. Now, do I think it'll happen? I have no idea. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be for Kansas City to do it three times in a row with the competition they have. But they have a coach, they got a quarterback, and they got some quality players and some wide receivers that actually, by the end of the year, figured out how to catch. And that, that was a big plus. So I think that's exciting. I think it's very exciting what's going on in the NFC North. I'm really excited about the Lions. I know Dan Campbell's a little bit off the wall with some of the things he does, but some of the things he does got them there, so I got to give him credit for that. I'm excited about this Jordan, this Love kid. I mean, at the end of the year with 22 or 23 touchdown passes and one interception at the end of the year, 
he would have been the MVP if they just looked at the last six or eight games. Yep. I mean, it, it's amazing that he played a little bit sloppy in the in the big game he had, and he lost to to San Francisco. But that they had a chance to win that game, as did the Lions. I'm I'm disappointed in in uh, Kyle Shanahan. He's been three Super Bowls, and in three Super Bowls, one of as a as an offensive coordinator, they they they've made history by losing one hell of a score. 28 to three at halftime. So I'm a little bit disappointed in how he ends up in, in these games. Oh, he's a and terrible he coach, Jim. He's terrible. Come on. He's well, terrible. I can't, I can't, I cannot say that, but, but you know, I used to play professional pool and I will tell you, I mean, there's been tournaments. There were tournaments that I played in that I actually, I think I lost before I ever went to the table. Because somehow you get it's your mind, your psyche. You you, it, 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 yeah, it, you psych yourself out, or you, you're too confident, or or it's a pressure point where you have to do something and you make the bad decision. He seems to not do the right thing to get over the hump. He's a great coach. Are you kidding me? This guy, he's a great coach, and he has, I mean, unbelievable talents on that team. Just think about the players that a defensive coordinator has to defend when you look at that roster coming out from the field starting you know it's incredible i happen to be a fan of purdy i think he's very good i think the, calling him mr irrelevant i'd like to i'd like to talk to the people that failed to draft them earlier because i think they're they're the boneheads that made the mistake it wasn't him he's actually very talented and he makes good decisions cmc is um oh my god he's not a quarterback but He's got to be in the top five to win the most valuable player at any point. I mean, the guy's incredible what he can do. Um, and, and even in the overtime, I mean, he was the guy they went to. Uh, but they kind of lost him in the third the third and fourth quarter a little bit. But the overtime, he was there. He was the primary guy. A great coach. And then and I, what's Seattle doing? They got rid of Carroll, who I think was a big mistake getting rid of him. Uh, I don't know what he's going to end up doing. I think he, God knows he has the energy. He has more energy at his age than I, than some 20 and 30 year olds that I, that I know that they don't have. So I'm, I'm very excited about what's going on in the NFL. And I do think for the quality of play this year will improve because as the season went on, some of these young players really started to develop and you started to see it with love. I mean, even you know, it's it's just across the league. There's big question marks in Miami because Tua is still a question mark for a lot of people, and rightfully so because he doesn't he doesn't fit the metrics for size and arm strength and all the things that go along with it. And eventually, that can catch up to you because you do get hit hard, you do get hurt, and when you, every time you get hurt, and I know I'm sitting here a little bit hurt right now, you're not the same guy. Because I'm also not 20 years old, so that that makes a difference as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as far as the Tua issue is concerned, Jim, uh, yeah, I think you have to give him his due. The the fact of the matter, the, the kid's a winner. Okay, he was a winner at Alabama. He's got a really great record with Miami. It's just not enough. Uh, so much was heaped on him with expectations, and he does have, like you said, some physical limitations. Uh, and he is surrounded with a lot of talent on the football team, so. Maybe more should have happened to Miami, but the fact of the matter is they made some noise this football season. They went into the playoffs, and uh, aside from uh, emptying out at the end of the season here, had they not done just that, they may have uh, gone even further in the playoffs here. The big decision down here in Miami is whether or not they're going to contract him because he's at the end of his rookie contract, and the question then becomes, you know, do we pay him all this money to keep moving forward? Or do we go another direction, especially this year on the National Football League draft, where there's a surplus of great talent as far as quarterbacks are concerned in the NFL? So, you know, they are going to feel some offers for uh, Tua uh, this offseason here before they get him to sign that contract. But so it's not a done deal down here in Miami yet. So even the Dolphins, I think, themselves aren't completely 100% sold on Tua as it is. I see uh, where Andy, Andy just came back. I, before, I know you're going to close this off real soon. But one of the things I mean, I'm I'm I was born and raised in Philadelphia, and I, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of any team. Don't get me wrong, but what happened with Philadelphia? And I know Andy stays on top of a lot of stuff like this, and Jalen and Hurts. 
what what do you think about him? He had that one real good year, almost won the Super Bowl against Kansas City, but the year before and this year was not so good, and they really collapsed at the end. I'm surprised they kept their head coach. And before that, I'd really like to hear Andy's take on that. Yeah, I'm not really sure you can pinpoint it. I mean, after all, this is a team that started 10-1, and one, and they were playing very, very well. They had some very nice wins and a couple of ugly loss, well, an ugly loss afterwards. Uh, their fade down the stretch, I, I don't know that I've heard anything definitive, but there may very well have been some inside uh, dissension in the locker room or everything. The players seem to support Jalen Hurts, so I don't think he was the issue. They did have an awful lot of injuries this year, but every team has injuries. But, you know, they had injuries throughout, yet they were able to overcome some of those early injuries to be 10-1 uh, and one, and then just totally uh, lost confidence, lost their momentum. I, I was a little – I wasn't totally surprised that uh, – uh, that the coach was kept because he did take him to the Super Bowl the year before. But there's got to be a lot of looking into what happened over the final six games of the season and then into the playoffs because this was a team that, uh, look, they were looked as though they were going to be the number one seed for you know more than half the season. So I really can't answer as to what went wrong because I'm just as stunned uh, as everybody. In fact, when you we know, one doing, of the things, we're... Andy, I think uh, is the um... – and, I, and we saw it towards the end of the season, and I think we're going to see it moving on, is that they were so dominant with the RPO the season before, and the rest of the league, it happens all the time, the rest of the league starts catching up. And if you can't run that play uh, the way the Eagles were running it in the previous season to perfection, then you're just taking it out of their game. And that's why we were watching some of the plays that they were making. I remember that Arizona game. Where they were make, where you saw it looked like he just didn't know what to do. Where normally he would, you know, he knew he he had the same option called, and then you'd see him like run a boot for about two or three yards, and he just sat down. It was the most weirdest, and, and the, the crowd just, they looked like they had no idea what was going on. He, so he did that. seem to show more hesitation than in the past. Yep. I think it has a lot to do with it. And when the teams have now more patience, which is what you have to have on defense with the RPO, you got to be patient. Those inside linebackers have to be patient. The more patient they are, then all of a sudden it's on you. You have to make the quick decision. And like you said, I just don't think he was uh, snappy enough. You know, the one thing about Jalen Hurts, guys, in my opinion anyway, uh, watching his career in college, I was really enthralled with him. Uh, at Alabama. I think he was a, a perfect player for a, a perfect head coach. I think he fit the system real well. Uh, perhaps he was uh, underappreciated, at least when the NFL draft came, he went in the second round. But after the, his success with Philadelphia and all that was uh, uh, praised upon him, he was elevated to this role of superstar quarterback. And I don't know if Jalen Hurts make up, makes him a superstar athlete. I don't think he looks at himself as a superstar athlete. I don't think he... Uh, he and he answers questions to people that want him to be a superstar athlete. So he may well have sort of Peter principle, if you will, to a level that maybe he wasn't able to handle. Yeah. And maybe if he comes back somewhat this year uh, and, you know, everything isn't thrown on him. Uh, I think you'll see a little bit better season out of Jalen Hurts this football season here. And I know in Philadelphia, uh, a lot of my good connections in Philadelphia, uh, Howard Eskin, especially I've been doing his radio show now for, over 45 years, unbelievable. Well, he's he's tuned into the Eagles. He's their sideline reporter right now. And uh, he was telling me that uh, what was really going on was uh, everybody just pointing. It's not hard for people in Philadelphia to, you know, to start pointing fingers, you know, at Santa Claus and everybody else. Well, when it happened, <laughs> <laughs> when it happened to the Eagles this year, it was all Nick Sirianni that they came down on and Jalen Hurts and so forth. And whatnot. I think all this football team needs this year is to take a step back Get a breath of fresh air, and maybe they, because the expectations won't be quite so high this year as they were last year. Remember, they were a Super Bowl loser last year, and they suffered the effects of that. Yeah, remember when we did the preseason show, Mark, and we were making predictions, and um, I actually went ahead and, and said, nope, I'm not going to put the Eagles in the postseason. And mo some of that had to do with the fact that I thought the Giants were going to be better. Or that the yes. Giants were going to overtake them, and if the if the Giants had played better, maybe maybe the Eagles. But the, it got off to such a great start that it was almost impossible for them not to make the postseason. But our point was taken late in the season when they started to fall apart. It was that Super Bowl loser kind of deal that just not all the time. You know, some Chiefs and the 
Bucks and the Tampa Bay, and that's because they had Brady and Mahomes. Some teams can overcome that, but most of the teams can't. Well, the Eagles looked like they were going to overcome it. Like Andy said, that great 10 and one start they had to the season here. They looked like they were blowing that theory to smithereens last year, but it ended up biting oh. them. Uh, Andy, what do you think about San Francisco now being the Super Bowl loser coming back this year? Will they fall prey to that or it'll be more of an effect of whether or not they can adjust and do things this year that they weren't able to do last year? Well, remember, they were minutes away from winning the Super Bowl. Yes. Uh, had several opportunities, you know, despite all the criticism of Shanahan's play calling, and I was amongst a, a number of them, they still had an opportunity with an outstanding defense that just couldn't stop Mahomes, but that probably says more about Mahomes than it does about any defense that uh, he would face. So the, the ingredients are still there. It's a young enough team with a lot of talent, very well balanced, I think, on both sides of the ball. But... We saw some of the, uh, you know, the, the team wore down defensively late in the season. We saw that in the two playoff games against a pair of teams that seemed to be on the rise, uh, Green Bay and uh, Detroit. The competition may be a little bit more difficult for San Francisco this coming year because you now have to include Dallas is still going to be a talented team. Philadelphia still has the talent if they can rebound from what they did. But it was kind of like when you're a 10-1 team and then all of a sudden you fall off the cliff, you can start 10 on one again next year, and then you're always going to have the thoughts in your mind that, gee, let's not let happen last year happen again this year. Chicago, we don't know what they're going to be. I mean, their defense showed great improvement over the second part of the season. Some changes in the uh, NFC South. We'll see what happens with Atlanta. So I think it may be a lot more. De- Plus, the Rams came back and started to look like the team that won, that was in you know, two Super Bowls in the last six years uh, throughout the season. So I think the competition in the NFC will be much better from the start of the season through the end of the season than it was going into the 2023 season. So uh, if I were, well, you're asking Kansas City to win a third straight Super Bowl or make it at least to a third straight Super Bowl. I would think they have a better, I still think Kansas City has a better chance of making it back to the Super Bowl than San Francisco does. Because they have a generational quarterback. Uh, you know, he if it's going to happen, it's going to happen with a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes for yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, keep an eye, too, on injuries because that's the thing that always is going to be the bugaboo. You talked about it with the Dolphins, Mark. Look at San Francisco. I mean, how, much, how many more years can Trent Williams keep going at this pace, being an awesome elite player? He's getting older. Uh, they're talking about maybe trading Brandon Ayuk. Um, uh, then you take a look yeah. at the Chiefs, who just haven't really had to deal with many injuries over the last few years. What happens if they well, have they a rash were, of injuries? Clean. And they quarterbacks, the they were all injured this year. What happens if they all stay healthy along the AFC sure. and they got to face those uh, quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers and all those other guys that missed Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow, Deshaun He's Watson? Bad. They're all healthy. It's going to be that much more harder. Well, that's my point, guys. My my topic about the worst thing uh, I saw about the National Football League this year was injuries to the quarterbacks. Uh, it became catastrophic. Uh, you saw what the Cleveland Browns started five different quarterbacks this football season here. What can the NFL do, Jim, about this situation, about these quarterbacks? Uh, they're so vital to the football teams, and you're watching second, third, and fourth string players that are behind center in football games in this uh, second half of the football season. It's not appealing to the fans. What do you think they can do? I have to go back to the fundamentals. I'm glad you asked that question. You know, we've seen the downgrade or the devaluation of the running back. I think that's a big mistake. The running backs do a lot more than run the football. They block. They're great. They're great security blankets for the quarterback when there's a lot of pressure. You can always dump it off. Offensive line and running back play has to improve for these quarterbacks to be able to stand up and do their job and not get hurt. And until the owners and the general managers and get their head out of their ass and realize football is the same as it was a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, we're going to say somebody peeking in from my pocket of the car. <laughs> it's a little crazy, but uh, if they build up the offensive line, we talk about Trent Williams. Well, we need more Trent Williams guys. And we need more guys that can do what he does. When Trent Williams was out of the lineup, San Francisco lost three straight games. Yeah, they're a different team. Yep. Yeah, they're a different team. You've got to find better offensive line play, and you have to have running backs that can not only run the ball, but can block and catch and give the, the quarterback a little bit more security blank and a little bit less of the downfield bombs. If you want them to bomb, they're wide open. They get hit by these 
linebackers and blitzers and and these defense defensive coordinators know how to do that. I think that's how you protect them. I, yeah, we have, I've talked about it before. The league does so much. They can't really do all that much more specifically to protect the quarterback than what they're doing. But I've talked about it before. Liberalize the offensive holding rules. I've never really fully understand why the offensive linemen can't do to the defensive linemen what the defensive linemen are doing to the offensive linemen. And I think that if you did that, you'd give the quarterback more time. He'd be more effective. And he'd also be under less pressure if the offensive linemen, especially marginal calls that they seem to call you. It's the old story about, you know, well, the NFL can basically control what happens because the referees and the officials can call holding on basically every play. Now, it doesn't apply. You, know, you don't see defensive holding along the line. You see defensive holding in the backfield, the defensive backfield uh, in pass plays. So, uh, I mean, you sort of say it jokingly, but really there's a lot of seriousness to what this discussion is about, and that is if you liberalize the, what the offensive linemen can do, it in and of itself will help protect the quarterback and the number of injuries should be much less. Hey, guys, uh, we're, we're going to put the wraps in this show here. Uh, this is our special presentation of the best and the worst from the 2023 college and pro football seasons here. And I'm going to run something by you guys. Uh, I, I, don't, I didn't tell you about this in advance. I just kind of wanted to get your answer right away conversationally about what you think might happen here. But in the National Football League, uh, the NFL draft is right around the corner, and that's really, really a big, big time of the offseason for the National Football League. Uh, what surprise do you see happening in the National Football League draft? I'm going to finish it out last because I'm going to lay a bombshell on you guys. But, uh, <laughs> Greg, what do you see a surprise happening in the National Football League this year's draft as a, uh, to build up for the 2024 season? Uh, well, I think the only surprise that I think makes the most sense that could happen and I still think might even happen is that maybe Jaden Daniels is the first pick of the draft. Well, that oh, would be a, that would be, wow. What's the odds on that, Greg? I don't know, but it's probably pretty good. So uh, I, I do it because I said we're starting to – again, we, we talked about it uh, over the last few months. I mean, the closer you get an opportunity to inspect these kids up – up and, and up and close and the scouts get a and especially the gms who are so busy during the regular season they don't have time to look at a lot of the stuff that the scouts do they get to now nitpick the the the, the kids they now get to talk to the kids they get to find out is this kid really the kind of kid that i want on my team scout says he loves him but i don't know I, i'm starting to see some warts there that i think uh i think that would be the biggest surprise that i think i could actually see happen instead of just you know throwing a surprise that'll never happen I'm going to tie that into my bombshell when we wrap this up here, uh, Greg, as well. Jim, what do you think uh, would happen in the National Football League draft that would be jaw-dropping in that sense this year? Uh, you might have asked me a question that I'm actually tongue-tied on. I'm not sure I can know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, we, you, we can all always look at that number one draft, who, who they're going to take, and I think Greg hit on that, and that might be the big issue because – Caleb Williams, they have they have some questions about some of the things he said, his leadership, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of the year. Uh, and this other Daniels has a lot of talent. He looks as, absolutely awesome. Um, I, bombshell for me is that the, the biggest Super Bowl winner of all time is even a head coach in the NFL anymore, and Bill Belichick. I wouldn't hire him because I think he's a little too stubborn to work with. But uh, in the NFL, but, you know, he does no football. So, and, then, and Pete Carroll is another guy that's been to a couple Super Bowls, won one, almost won the second one, been around a long time. He's not coaching. So, uh, they're surprises for me, but I can understand why people may not want to hire them. We might see both Belichick and Carroll doing some color work for the National Football League Networks. I think their expertise would be really welcome in that particular sense. Andy, what do you? What's your take on what you think might be the biggest surprise coming out of this well, year's Well, there draft? are two that I'm comment going to comment on because I think I would now be surprised if the Bears did not trade uh, Justin Fields. I I felt that they've invested enough in him, and they could surround him with even more talent. They should hold on to him. So I think I would be surprised. However, if uh, I'm if I'm uh, not right, uh, I won't be surprised if I'm not right. And they do uh, make the uh, trade. Uh, uh, of Justin Fields, uh, and it sort of goes along. Uh, but the other, I guess, the surprise is sort of along the lines of what Greg was alluding to, and that is that Caleb Williams is not the number one draft choice. I could understand Jalen Daniels. I mean, keep in mind, Daniels faced SEC defenses, 
Williams faced Pac-12 defenses that are not nearly as strong, and the performance that he had this year did not come close to matching his Heisman Trophy winning season of 2022. So I, I would say the biggest surprise might very well be if if uh, Caleb Williams does not go as the number one draft choice, regardless of what happens with what the Bears do with that choice. Okay, let's circle around all those things. Our topic here is largely about this number one draft pick in the draft uh, upcoming here and whether or not uh, Justin Fields will be the Chicago Bears quarterback next year. If he's not, will, what quarterback will they draft and so forth and whatnot. I read something very, very interesting which really caught my eye, and I said to myself, no way in God's green earth can this happen. But you stop and you think about what I'm going to tell you here. It could happen. Uh, Justin Fields, I think the Chicago Bears, I like what Greg said about Jaden Daniels. The Bears go for Jaden Daniels. So what are they going to do with Justin Fields? Well, actually, it, it could be anybody. It could be, I understand. Yeah, I understand. It, it could be traded. anybody. Yeah, and it, could be, uh, it could be May. You know, But anyway, uh, I think I, I would agree with you. I think it, uh, Daniels would make a, a would make a, a a really really great number. I don't know if this is part of your guess, but I'm thinking Broncos or Steelers for Fields. No, I'm going to tell you the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> oh, oh, Cleveland yeah. Browns. Uh, and the reason being is uh, everything that I read about this is this. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of a market for uh for fields if you will as far as trades go in the national football league draft this year and if there aren't and he ends up becoming uh if they do take daniels and fields is still on the roster he gets to be the second or the third round and all of a sudden they get approached about daniels and they make some uh, offers to the bears that maybe perhaps they couldn't refuse well if the browns reeled in if they reeled uh fields into cleveland uh, a couple of good things happened to the cleveland browns number one uh, you know what's going on with Deshaun Watson here, and it, it, it's almost like you're, you're waiting for this uh, this rubber band to snap on this whole situation here. He's not endeared at all to the fans in Cleveland, not to anybody in the National Football League. He hasn't worked out well. They're paying him a boatload of money here, and the money that they would pay Fields as opposed to Watson would be a bargain in a sense. So now they can rest comfortably knowing that they've got a quarterback here in fields that they can build with on moving forward in the future in the national football he is indeed a first round quarterback he played at ohio state and he's got a big big strong following of fans in cleveland does fields so all i'm going to say is let's not drop our uh, or let our jaws drop when all of a sudden in the second or third round you find the chicago bears trade Justin Fields and the Cleveland Browns are the guys that make the The only trade question I have with that is the status of what would be owed to Deshaun Watson by the Browns. It's it's money that you have to eat, Andy. Uh, you know, when you're a billionaire and uh, and you're going to eat <laughs> and you're yeah. going to eat uh, you're going to eat 300 million. Uh, that's like eating a couple of good meals. <laughs> uh, it's all very, part of the very good, very good meals. Yeah, it's very good meals, but it's all part of the game. It's the cost of doing business. Yeah, you're, you're, right. you're right. And I think the Browns focus more here. Uh, and Andrew Barry is a very, very sharp general manager. I think he wants this football team to be surrounded with as much talent as he possibly can that will give him his best chance to win. And when the realization comes that Deshaun Watson is not that guy and they have a chance to make a move in this offseason to, uh, to remedy that situation, again, I wouldn't be surprised if it's – if it ends up being Fields that goes to Cleveland and he ends up being the quarterback for the Browns. Mark, Mark, hats off to you. That is a bombshell, and I can actually see where there's a lot of wisdom in that thinking. That uh, a, really couple of th- a couple of work. things on that. First of all, uh, keep in mind the Browns gave up, what, three first-round picks, yes. I believe? And that would be not just the money, but they'd be saying, well, we just gave three first-round draft picks away. That wouldn't be very, uh, I would think, um, I mean, the owner would obviously have to be on an uh, agreement with this. It'd be like, oh, yeah. Be like I'm, a Trey Lance, Trey Lance San Francisco giant type thing where they I'm moved up. I'm completely in agreement with you. Um, but, uh, but if they do this before, um, it may not be as soon as 25. You may have to wait until the 26 offseason. Um, they would lose practically half of their salary cap space on, on letting Watson go. So now you're losing half of your salary cap space and you've given up three first. So again, can it be done? Of course, because what's more important, like you're saying, Mark, what's more important to 
not have this, not have that, or just to keep the virus with us, that is just going to preclude us from winning anyway. So that's going to be the big question. Um, you know, I, I, I think if you're thinking about crazier things, uh, then Tell me. yeah, I mean, exactly. So it's not the craziest, uh, thought in the world. And that's exactly what the, the whole point of this conversation was. Well, you know, unfortunately, accountants have become as big a part of the personnel roster decision process as GMs and coaches and the uh, scouts and the uh, GMs. Yeah, the uh, salary cap issues. Salary cap uh, people that can figure that are masters. I mean, they're, they're wizards. Uh, the Browns have a, a, a good person. In fact, they just freed up a lot of salary cap space when they reworked uh, – uh, Denzel Ward's contractor, so it gives them a little bit more maneuverability. But every team has a, a player or like that that can solve salary cap issues. So, you know, again, I'm going to allude to the fact that when you have billionaires with pockets that are as deep as the ocean, uh, I don't think, you know, having to eat a couple hundred million dollars in a contract is going to keep them up at night. I don't, I think they're more concerned about whether or not they're going to be able to win a football game and make it to the Super Bowl. I think that's the biggest question. Well, guys, I really thoroughly enjoyed the show uh, this week, and I also enjoyed thoroughly working with you throughout this 2023-24 football season. We're going to really look forward to doing more of the same next year and moving forward here. We'll be doing a weekly basketball show. As I mentioned, Andy Isco will be joining us, Jim Feist. Tony Mejia will also be joining us on the show, Playbook Experts, along with our producer, uh, Greg De Palma. So stay tuned for that. This week's basketball show will be available here on the Playbook Experts YouTube channel and also at playbooksports.com. Until that show, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always. <laughs>